Welcome to Trinity Online. So glad that you've joined us this weekend. Uh, my name is Dave. I, nice to meet you, Dave. I am Scott. It is great to have you here today. And it has already been a fantastic week at Trinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This last Wednesday, we had our very first family at the farm. That was at Helen's Acres. And it was not only hot, it was smoky. It was smoking hot. I don't even know how to go on from that. That is... <laughs> Sure, Dave, it was smoking hot, but actually beyond that, it was an awesome experience together. Uh, what was your favorite part? Uh, I seen a bunch of people I have not seen for the longest time, connecting, meeting them. And not only that, I met eight people who had never been in our auditorium, but were there last night. Yeah, and they're not going to be in our auditorium <laughs> yeah, for some true time. story, actually. That's very true. How about you? Uh, actually, n- similar, uh, seeing people that have never been at our church before connect with people that have been there for a while, and just seeing those relationships start awesome. is just, it was so, so great. And singing together. It was so great to sing together. That was good. The way you said that was like this, like it had extra <laughs> oomph, dude. That was awesome. Well, it was a great night. It and really and was. we're actually going to sing together today too, aren't we? We are. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, our service starts with a new song that the band put together uh, called Peace. And it's so timely in this season. And then we're going to hear a testimony of Monica and mm. her journey towards baptism. And I got to say, like I, those stories of baptism always inspire me and encourage me because it just makes me realize, you know, we're all human and we all have a story that has incredible chapters in it. And on top of that, I'm so thankful for our band, our tech, and our musicians all the time. They just kill it. And 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 that's too true. And not only that, we have some incredible teaching pastors here. And one of them, uh, Mrs. Sarah Stanley, is back up today talking on the third fruit of the Spirit, peace. It's going to be so good. We also recognize that this week has been hard for our community Mm. on a bunch of different fronts, Uh, a local tragedy and then the fires. And so we thought it would be so appropriate just to spend some time in prayer before we get into the rest of the service. So Scott, why don't you lead us? Love to. Hey God, we're so grateful, as Dave said, for this day and the place that we live. Uh, Father, many of us have been uh, part of Kelowna for many, many years, and we have a lot of brand new people that we're meeting. And they're discovering the beauty and the grandeur of what you have created here, but also uh, the connectedness that we experience. And part of that is when uh, somebody hurts and somebody experiences tragedy, we all do. Mm. And so, Father, would you be with those family members today that have been involved in that tragedy? Mm. Would you encourage them, bring yourself near to them as your promise to Mm. do that has never failed? And God, we're so grateful that you know what's going on. You know the stories around us. And and on top of that, uh, as our skies are smoky and the smell of fire is around, Mm. we're just reminded again is how fragile life can be. And Father, so we just pray for your protection around our valley and into the Okanagan. And on top of that, uh, for the firefighters and the first line responders, just protect them. And God, we're so grateful that we can call out to you when we're worried, when we're joyful, when we're fearful. Mm. You listen, you respond, and you answer our prayers. And Father, uh, thank you just that we can do life together now in connected community even more so. And uh, just the opportunity to do that at the farm this last week was just so encouraging to see faces and to pray together, to sing together, and just be together uh, how you designed us to be the church. Uh, So, 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 so good. And so, Father, for our church, we just pray right now for all the moving pieces, for people coming back into connection, for our TCAs Mm. to continue as we're uh, continuing to have these weekend experiences be digital. Um, Father, would you call people into community? Would you you increase our desire to be connected to each other, to encourage each other to continue to pray? And Father, we know that your hand is in all things and that you want the very best for us. And so, God, we just pray for your best in our lives as we move forward. We love you, Father. Thanks that we get to do this together. Amen. Amen. You will stay true Even when the lies come Your word remains true Even when my thoughts don't Do anxiety come? 
promise you keep. Peace is a promise you keep. You will stay true. Well, I grew up in a Greek Orthodox um, environment, um, being obviously from uh, immigrant Greek parents. So my understanding of God was it was a Sunday morning um, thing that we did. Um, and then we left. <laughs> And then we went on with our week. And it sounds weird, but it's so true. Because even though I've known the name God and that God exists and that Christ existed, that was really the extent of my understanding. I think it was when I started having children that I really started to seek out how to best get them to know God. And, and how I could be a better role model for them so that they did not go through those ups and downs and struggles that I had to go through, right? So I think that that was sort of my first real seek out and go, okay, what does it really mean to be a Christian and how can I em em emulate that? And then um, we came to Trinity and I remember the first day that I stepped into Trinity, um, if anyone's been in an Orthodox church, it's very prim and proper. And I remember opening the doors in Trinity and it was like a rock concert. <laughs> it was like a rock concert. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so different than when I grew up. And uh, and I just, but I could just feel the energy and the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm just like, and, and it actually, like I'm saying it now, and it still brings goosebumps. So I grew exponentially in, in, uh, at Trinity and just with my girls and they did a lot of adventure land stuff and we would, and then we started talking about God and praying together and that the, the, there was always this little voice right that was always like but there's always this little whisper that you're gonna be okay just keep going right just keep seeking just keep going um, keep trusting keep keep your faith, right? And just keep going, put one foot in front of the other. And my life has been 
to say a Walt Disney roller coaster is probably an understatement. <laughs> I think if anybody ever joined um, the ride that I've been on, there's been so many ups and downs and life altering um, changes. But I've always known, um, there, the, I've always felt that, that God was walking beside me and, I, and, I, and that little voice just keep going, right? I'm right here. What do you know about God now that you didn't before? He, he really has made me for a purpose and it doesn't matter if I have failed relationships or if I'm not perfect in my job or perfect in my in in as a mom or perfect as a neighbor etc that God loves me and accepts me for who I am and every day he's molding me to be a better um, version of who he wants me to be and I think that that has really been such a powerful um realization in my life, struggling with self-image and self-worth. That has really been a pivotal moment in my life. Today, Jesus is um, first and foremost Lord over my life, for without a doubt. Um, and, and secondly, Jesus is my very best friend. He, he is somebody that I talk to about absolutely everything um, through you know, whether it's I'm struggling at a stoplight because the person in front of me is going too slow because <laughs> I really have to go pick up my kids and I'm 10 minutes late or, or somebody that, you know, when I'm when I'm struggling with my insecurities or or when I'm struggling with a decision that I have to make. Um, and, and just as 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 my Lord and my friend, he he is in control of my entire life. And my, my kids saw this this thing on my um, on my calendar and it's lunch with God. And I remember Tim talking about this in um, uh, um, a sermon that he did when many, many years ago. And my kids are like, what do you mean lunch with God? Right. What does that mean? I'm like, well, it means, you know, you go and have lunch with your best friend. <laughs> In honor of him, I'd like to publicly um, declare that he is my Lord and Savior, and I want to be baptized as an adult um, just so that I can actually show that commitment. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you afternoon or whatever time of day you're watching this, whether that's live with Trinity Weekends or catching it later on the archives. It's so good to be back with you in this way, though technically I haven't gone anywhere. I've just had the absolute joy of doing church alongside you from home in this season as we welcomed our son Emerson back in January. We've been doing church from our basement, kitchen table, and backyard. And I always joke that I'm checking him into Trinity Kids as we put him in the pack and play to watch the service. <laughs> I love that we're getting to spend some time unpacking each of the fruit of the Spirit this summer. There are some profound thoughts from Josh that I've continued to wrestle with this past week. One in particular, that for the people in the book of Nehemiah, their joy isn't determined by their present, but it's rooted in the past and it's looking forward to a hopeful future. This passage, it comes to life in fresh ways for me living in the Okanagan. I'm reminded of it almost every time I walk by an orchard, visit a winery, or pick raspberries in my own backyard. See, the life unpacked in Galatians chapter 5, it's one of following Jesus, of being led by and keeping in step with the Spirit. This is the very heart and power of living for Christ. Paul's words in Galatians chapter 5, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. The third fruit Paul lists in this passage and that we get to unpack today, peace. Today's world is desperate for it. A survey reported by Stats Canada that was conducted just this past fall found that one in five Canadian adults screened positive for symptoms of depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And youth, they've experienced the greatest declines in mental health since the pandemic began. Where are you looking for peace? Maybe you need it to drown out feelings of loneliness. You want it desperately for your kids who are fighting constantly and you're only a couple of weeks into summer. You long to experience an inner peace to calm your mind and still your soul, to drown out the financial worries and fears about the future. You need it to show up in your marriage that's been on the rocks after months of tension at home. Or you yearn for it to show up in the world around you in situations that you see on the news that break your heart 
and leave you feeling paralyzed. See, this biblical peace that Paul refers to, it isn't a peace that comes when our circumstances change or when life has calmed down and the pressures disappear and stress dissipates. Rather, as one author points out, it's a supernatural power that flows through us and pushes out turmoil, worry, and anxiety. In fact, it's not simply a peace that we're meant to experience, but one we are also designed to fight for on behalf of others. A spirit-infused life of following Jesus is seeped in both the experience of a peace beyond understanding and the call to peacemaking in all circumstances. The word peace, it shows up 80 times and in every book of the New Testament. Peace be with you were Jesus' first words to his disciples when he appeared to them following his death and resurrection in John chapter 20. Gathered in an upper room, the disciples were uncertain about the future, wrestling with unanswered questions and mourning the loss of their friend and rabbi. But when Jesus walked into the room, everything changed. Peace was present. Peace be with you. This same phrase has been used as a liturgical greeting in the church for centuries. The Greek word for peace in the New Testament is erene. It is roughly equivalent to the Hebrew word in the Old Testament that you might be more familiar with, shalom. Here's what I love about that word. This shalom peace, it's not simply the absence of conflict or trouble, but a wholeness, a completeness, or even a returning to the way something was intended to be. Pursuing shalom, it means asking the question, what does wholeness look like in the middle of this messy situation, in this strained relationship with a sibling, or amidst the tension in a marriage? What does shalom peace look like in the community that you call home? We see this peace lived out in Jesus, both in him and through his relationship and trust with the Father, making a way for us to be reconciled to God through his death and resurrection. My own journey of understanding peace as a fruit of the Spirit, it's been complex. I'll never forget a phone interview with my boss at the very first church I worked at after Bible college. As part of the hiring process, he wanted to make sure that I was clear on two positions the church held that could be a little bit spicy. <laughs> First, their belief in women in leadership, which he pointed out would have been awkward if I wasn't on board, seeing as he was hiring me for a pastoral position in the youth ministry. Secondly, their peace position. He unpacked it briefly and I was quick to agree. Yeah, I'm all for peace. But it would be a journey over the next few years of theological study, intentional conversations, and the work of the Spirit in me to understand that biblical peace is not simply something where we're designed to experience, but a peace that we are called to embody and champion. It's a peace that leads me into the darkest areas of injustice and calls me to learn, to listen, to ask questions, and to take action for the sake of Christ and each person he died for and loves. In the life of faith, one becomes infused by the Spirit and as a result, bears the fruit of the Spirit. So what might that look like for you in this season? Perhaps you need to first experience biblical peace, erene, shalom. For you, growing in this fruit of the Spirit begins by getting to know the peacemaker. If your world is chaotic and loud, it might first look like learning to experience and rest in the peace that can only be found in Christ. Jesus is the peacemaker himself and the very reason that we're able to experience peace with God and with one another. We must start by getting to know him. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, he points to the coming Messiah, Jesus, calling him the Prince of Peace, who would come to restore relationships and make things right between God and humanity. We first experience biblical peace when we enter into right relationship with God. When we recognize our brokenness and sin and ask for forgiveness, when we receive his unending grace. Our souls discover an increasing stillness and peace when we come before the Father with the same surrender modeled by Jesus and say, 
whatever lies ahead, Lord, your will be done in my life. If you're just exploring what a relationship with God could look like, lean in. This peace is available to you and your next step might be right here. Saying yes to a lifelong journey of following Jesus, of experiencing and embodying peace as you get to know the Prince of Peace himself. Perhaps you're a relatively new Christ follower or you've been a committed Christian for years, but if you're honest, you've lost your way and your heart and mind feel riddled by anxiety. Maybe today, you need to be reminded to rest in the peace available to you. The song we heard earlier in the service refers to God as my Jehovah Shalom, meaning the Lord is peace. The lyrics say, there's a peace far beyond all understanding. May it ever set my heart at ease. Dare anxiety come, I'll remember that peace is a promise you keep. Peace is a promise you keep. It's the promise that Paul refers to in Philippians chapter four. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As you go throughout your week, Pay attention. <laughs> the truth is, when you feel anxious or nervous, that's not of God. The Holy Spirit is a non-anxious presence in you. In those moments of anxiety, pause. Breathe deeply in and out. Be reminded of Jesus' words to his disciples. To us in John chapter 16, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Calming, stilling, it's the peace that Jesus brings to a boat full of terrified disciples when he calms the storm in Luke chapter eight. So again, growing in this fruit of the spirit, peace, it begins with getting to know the peacemaker. It's only then that we can discover our calling to be peacemakers in the world around us. Trask and Goodall in their book, The Fruit of the Spirit, they write that because we belong to the one who created peace and we live a life of peace, we can become a peacemaker. If you know the peacemaker, he will produce within you the fruit of the spirit called peace. See, as we increasingly experience a peace of the spirit that transcends situations and circumstances, the next step of maturity is discovering what it means to live a life of peace, both in the quiet of our souls and in the actions of our lives. The end goal actually isn't to sit and feel totally at peace in our own little hearts. If that's where we stop, we've completely missed the point. The fruit of the spirit, peace, shalom, is to be embodied and championed. Dr. Randy Woodley, an indigenous leader and Christian theologian, writes that shalom is communal, holistic and tangible. There is no private or partial shalom. The whole community must have shalom or no one has shalom. As long as there are hungry people in a community that is well-fed, there can be no shalom. Shalom is not for the many, while a few suffer, nor is it for the few, while many suffer. It must be available for everyone. That thought knocked me off my feet, convicting me in the best way. See, I can be so selfish, so concerned about my world, my emotions, my desire to be at peace. But the truth is, if it stops with me, it is not shalom. A few years ago, a friend of mine made shirts to support a local nonprofit. Now, we've seen shirts with clear messaging a lot in this season. Ones that say, social distancing, if you can read this, you're too close. Or introverts, doing the social distancing thing before it was cool. Or my favorite onesie given to us by a friend, can't touch this. Seriously, we're in a pandemic. But these shirts that my friend had made, they said, Peace begins with me. Peace 
begins with me. And I have to ask myself, does it? When a relationship in my life is fractured, am I quick to initiate restoration and healing? When I read the headlines and I feel a burning anger towards injustice, do I simply sit and long for a world without conflict? Or do I understand that it begins with me? Do I look introspectively and consider what part I might play? Do I take seriously the call in scripture to bear one another's burdens and to love my neighbor? How do we become peacemakers? I'm still very much on a journey of learning, but here's what I'm discovering. Becoming a peacemaker, it means taking a posture of learning, naming the reality that I'm not always going to get it right, but that I'm committed to the journey. It means seeking out perspectives and stories that differ from my own. Becoming a peacemaker means seeking out voices and perspectives from my brothers and sisters who can help me understand areas of brokenness and committing to both active listening and acts of peacemaking. Becoming a peacemaker it means recognizing and naming my own privilege simply because of the color of my skin. In response to Black Lives Matter, not simply posting a black square, but pairing it with active allyship and committing to help work toward real change. It means not taking for granted the fact that I can walk down the street without getting blamed for causing a deadly virus. Becoming a peacemaker, it means not looking away. It means entering in, lamenting alongside at the news of children's graves discovered at residential school sites right here in Canada and mourning thousands of lives lost at the hand of the church. How unimaginably that must break the Father's heart. I've been sitting with this timely, uncomfortable truth from Oshida Moore coming out of Jeremiah 6.14. It says, We can't have shalom if we put a bandage over a gaping wound and call it healed. Moore writes a beautiful piece called Shalom that I believe really outlines the journey of embodying and championing peace as we get to know the peacemaker himself. So as I read it, perhaps the spirit might prompt you with a personal next step. Shalom. We are invited. We are beloved. We are enough. We will see beauty. We will rest. We will choose subversive joy. We will tell better stories. We will serve before we speak. We will build bridges, not walls. We will choose ordinary acts of peace. We will show up, say something, and be still. We will be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. A spirit-infused life of following Jesus, it seeped in both the experience of a peace beyond understanding and the call to peacemaking in all circumstances. It is a beautiful, rugged, holy path, and it is a worthy calling. Perhaps this week, you could commit to one practical step towards both embodying peace and becoming a peacemaker. Some ideas? Memorize Philippians 4, 6-7 as God's promise of peace. End every email or text with peace or shalom. Reach out to mend a broken relationship. Take an intentional posture of learning. That could look like reading a book that will challenge your perspective and open your eyes, or having a raw and honest conversation with a friend who perhaps has a very different lived reality to you. Ask questions, listen actively, repent, and ask for input. I was recently challenged by a friend in response to the discovery of grave sites at residential schools to take the time to slowly read through the 94 calls to action coming out of the Truth and Reconciliation Report from 2015. One a day for 94 days. A small step towards learning. See, the road of peacemaking, it's a long one, and one that must be traveled in community and led by the Holy Spirit at work in us. In just a moment, the Talk About It questions are going to come up. 
They're questions that will help us wrestle with what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to increasingly help us both embody and champion peace in our lives and in the world around us. I'm going to wrap up our time together today with a prayer commonly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi and one which will change your life if you really live it out. Would you pray with me? Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah. And make sure that you stick around for the talk about questions and have that conversation with the people that you're watching. Totally with. love the talk about questions. And don't forget, next week, Family at the Farm is going to be fantastic. We have a power packed experience for you. Bring your picnic, bring your blanket, bring a friend. We've got Josh and Bex kicking it off with some incredible music. We got a family trivia night with prizes, I think. D Big prizes. Big, huge <laughs> prizes. And then capping the evening off with Norm Strauss. It's going to be a great evening. Check out all of our social media channels, our website to find out all the details. And we'll see you next week right yes. back here for Trinity Online. Bye-bye. <laughs>